Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and uh, welcome back to this next video and uh, this is yet another video in the uh, series of videos on the uh, inherited genetic disorders uh, in my previous videos uh, I talked to you about the autosomal dominant disorder and uh, we use the Huntington disease as an example of the autosomal dominant disorder uh, then in the other videos I talked about the sickle cell anemia uh, as an example of the autosomal recessive genetic disorder and uh, I'll share the link in the description now in this particular video I want to focus on another important autosomal recessive genetic disorder and this is the cystic fibrosis so cystic fibrosis will be uh, another important example of the autosomal recessive genetic disorder so uh, what is cystic fibrosis now the cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder what i mean by the autosomal recessive is that the gene that is responsible for causing this disease is present on an autosome that means from the uh, chromosome number one to the chromosome number 22 we usually call them as the autosomes so the gene that is responsible for causing the cystic fibrosis as it is present on the chromosome number seven so this is autosomal in nature uh, by recessive i mean that both copies of this particular gene need to be mutated for causing this particular disease this is what we call is the recessive so as the gene is present on the autosome and uh, both the copies that need to be mutated therefore the cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder and what happens in the cystic fibrosis is that there is severe damage to the lungs the pancreas the liver and other organs in the body now uh, what the uh, cystic fibrosis what it do is that it is going to affect those particular cells that produce the mucus uh, the sweat and the digestive juices and you will see that in a while uh, why these organs they are affected uh, when there is a problem with the uh, gene that is responsible for causing the cystic fibrosis now the secreted fluids they are normally thin and slippery so if you talk about the mucus or the sweat or the digestive juices uh, so they usually are really thin and they are really slippery but in people with the uh, cystic fibrosis there is a defective gene uh, which is known as the cystic fibrosis a transmembrane conductance regulator gene and this particular gene is actually responsible for making an ion channel and that particular ion channel is called is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator protein or ion channel and the function of this particular ion channel is that it uh, usually uh, that it usually is responsible for the exchange of the chloride ions uh, and that chloride ion is actually keeping these mucus the sweat and the digestive juices in a thin form but when there is problem with this particular ion channel what happens is that the secretion they become sticky and thick and instead of acting as a lubricant then the secretion plug up the tubes the ducts and the passageways especially in the lung and the pancreas therefore uh, it is actually making these kind of the secretions as thick and sticky uh, instead of uh, making them thin and slippery so there is a problem with the uh, uh, mucus or the other kind of the uh, liquids that are produced in the body now let us discuss something about the uh, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator protein for short that is known as the uh, cftr so we will call that as the cftr now the gene that code the human cftr protein that is found on the chromosome number seven uh, on the long arm at position number q31 so this is the locus for this particular gene and the protein that is made by this particular gene is 1480 amino acid long now what the cftr protein do is that it helps to maintain the balance of salt and water on many surfaces in the body such as the surfaces of the lung but when this protein is not working correctly chloride which is a very important component of uh, these fluids they become trapped in the cell and when there is trapping of the chloride ion in the cell what happens is that without the proper movement of the chloride water cannot hydrate the cellular surfaces 
and if the water cannot hydrate the cellular surfaces this lead to the mucus covering the cell to become thick and sticky causing many of the symptoms associated with the cystic fibrosis so normally what happens is that then if this is the uh, normal cftr channel so this is an ion channel for the chloride ions and with the help of these uh, chloride ion channels the uh, chloride ion they are going to move outside the cell and when they go to the surfaces of the cell uh, what they do is that they are going to make this mucus thin because the chloride ion that is attracting water toward itself and if the concentration of the water is increasing of course the mucus that will be thin but when there is mutation in the cftr protein or this ion channel as you can see over here the chloride ion that get trapped inside the cell it is not going to move to the surfaces of the cell and when it cannot move to the surfaces of the cell what happens is there is a decrease in the water concentration in the mucus uh, in the mucus you usually see uh, that mucus is 97 percent water and chloride ion is very important in keeping the water concentration or the water level at 97 percent but when these chloride ions they cannot move outside the cell on the surfaces of the cell the mucus that is covering the surfaces of the cell they become sticky and when they become sticky they are associated with many of the symptoms that we will discuss in the next video that are associated with the uh, cystic fibrosis before going into the uh, mutations and the uh, defects that are there in the uh, CFTR protein, uh, I want to uh, tell you what happens when you are going to uh, make a protein or an ion channel in the body. So this is a very uh, brief overflow uh, or the uh, flow sheet of what happens is when you are going to make the proteins uh, or the ion channels in the body. Now, as I've told you that the gene, they are going to make the proteins. So the gene that is present in the nucleus of the cell, uh, all of the genes, they are present in the nucleus of the cell. So the gene for the CFTR protein that is also present in the uh, nucleus of the cell. And that is, uh, and that is coding for all of the information that is needed for making a functional copy of the CFTR protein. Now this uh, gene that is, uh, you can say transcribed into a, into a messenger RNA molecule uh, in the process which is known as the transcription. So the transcription simply means the conversion of the message in the DNA into a messenger RNA molecule in a phenomena known as the transcription. Now, when the messenger RNA that has been formed, that moves into the cytoplasm of the cell, and in the cytoplasm of the cell, you have got these uh, synthetic uh, protein machinery, which are known as the ribosomes. So the ribosome are going to convert this RNA into the uh, proteins. So you will be having uh, a newly folded CFTR protein. And this particular phenomena in which the RNA is converted into the sequences of the amino acid, by that I mean a protein, this particular phenomena is known as the translation. I'll be having a detailed video on the process of the transcription, uh, as well as the translation uh, but in this particular uh, uh, in this particular scenario i'm only telling you the uh, uh, only the meaning of these terms what the transcription means the transcription means you are changing the message from the dna into messenger rna form and in the translation you are changing the uh, messenger rna into the uh, protein so there is uh, you can say a translation of the uh, message that is stored in the dna into rna and then into the uh, protein now once the uh, protein that has been made the cftr protein moves through the cell to the surface and this particular phenomena is known as the trafficking because you need the uh, cftr protein and this is an ion channel so you need that on the uh, surface of the protein so once the protein that has been made and that has been made mature so the mature cftr protein is going to move to the surface of the uh, epithelial cells and when that move to the epithelial cells uh, the surface of the epithelial cells then they are going to maintain the chloride ion concentration uh, inside and outside in and um, in an, uh, in a concentration that is required for the cell so this is general uh, overflow how the cftr protein or any kind of the protein that is made now what happens in the uh, uh, cystic fibrosis is that there is a mutation in the cftr genes 
a lot of mutation that have been reported in this particular video i am only focusing on the most important mutation that is mostly reported in more than 70 percent of the cystic fibrosis cases now uh, what happens is that during this particular mutation uh, there is a deletion uh, at the position number 508 and when there is uh, a deletion at the uh, position number uh, 508 what i mean by that is that the code the three letter codon like in this particular case you can see the c t t and this is a three letter codon that is deleted and this particular uh, codon that actually codes for an amino acid which is the phenyl alanine and the feline alanine after this mutation uh, when there is a mutation the phenyl alanine uh, at position number 508 that is not there for example if you talk about the uh, normal cftr protein as you can see over here at position number 506 you have got the codon atc that codes for the isoleucine then you got the another atc that code for an isoleucine then you have got the t t and the t and this particular code for the phenyl anony so what happens is that during this particular mutation these three pieces the c t t they are gone they are deleted and if you see about the uh, abnormal cftr protein as you can see the atc that remain at its place the at that is still at its place but this particular c T and T, they are gone. And when they are gone, it means that this A, T, and then the, it utilizes this particular T. And the A, T, T, it also codes for the isoleucine. So there are, you can see, uh, many codons for a single amino acid. And this is just one of the examples that the A, T, C, it codes for the isoleucine, but the A, T, T, that also codes for the isoleucine. So in the uh, mutated copy, this phenyl anadine that is deleted. So this uh, term delta, as you can see over here, this delta mean deletion. Uh, this F is for the uh, phenyl alanine, a single letter code for the amino acid phenyl alanine. And this 508, it is actually showing you the position of the amino acid which is deleted. So this means that at position number 508, normally there is a phenyl alanine, but in case of the cystic fibrosis, the 508, the uh, phenyl alanine at position number 508 that has been deleted thereby coding for an abnormal cftr protein and that abnormal cftr protein do not allow the uh, movement of the chloride ions from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell to attract water towards the mucus to make it thin now what happens is that the uh, cystic fibrosis uh, that affect many organs in the body or many areas of your body for example it can uh, affect your sinuses uh, because the mucus is a very important part of the sinuses and when the mucus become thick it is going to make that particular individual prone to many kind of the infection in their sinuses the major part that is affected because of the cystic fibrosis that is the lung and that is because of the uh, accumulation of the thick sticky mucus that build up and that particular thick sticky mucus that is helping uh, in the bacterial growth it is making a favorable environment for the infection of the bacteria so there are uh, very frequent infection in the lungs of the patient with the cystic fibrosis uh, it can also cause problem in the skin because the uh, sweat glands they are going to produce the uh, salty sweat uh, the liver that is blocked because of the, and the barley duct that is in the liver that is blocked and because of that the uh, uh, the bile that is produced in the liver it cannot move into the gallbladder uh, the pancreas the pancreatic ducts they are also blocked because of this thick mucus the intestine they cannot fully absorb nutrients and the reproductive organs in the male and females there are also complications uh, in patients with the cystic fibrosis and that is all because of the problem with the cftr protein now let us uh, dive a little bit deep into the uh, structure of the cftr protein when you talk about the uh, structure of the cftr protein normally there are five domains in the uh, cftr protein uh, one domain that is known as the TMD1. By TMD1, I mean this is the uh, transmembrane domain 1. It's also known as the membrane spanning domain, but this TMD, this is the transmembrane domain 1. 
so the membrane spanning domain and the transmembrane domain they are one in the same thing so there are two transmembrane domains over here there are two other domains which are known as one is known as the nbd1 the other one is known as the nbd2 and this nbd actually goes for the nucleotide binding domain so this n is for the nucleotide this b is for the binding and this d is for the domain you have got the nucleotide binding domain one then you have got the nucleotide binding domain two and there is uh, another domain also present in the cftr protein which is known as the r domain which is actually the uh, regulatory domain and this regulatory domain is actually uh, regulating the activity of the cftr protein by that i mean that it is responsible for turning on the cftr protein when it is needed and it is responsible for turning off the cftr protein when it is needed so that depend on the uh, conditions now this uh, CFTR protein it is also known as the cyclic AMP activated ATP gated anion channel. So the CFTR protein and the cyclic AMP activated ATP gated anion channel they are one in the same thing. They are two different names. Sometimes in the literature you will see this name for the CFTR protein. But most of the time you will be seeing that the term CFTR uh, ion channel that is used for this kind of the ion channel but this name is also valid for the CFTR protein. Now what happens is that if you are talking about a single protein this is the N terminal domain so from here your protein starts it is going to uh, spin the membrane one time which is known as the transmembrane domain one then you have got the um, nucleotide binding domain one then you have got the regulatory domain then you have got the transmembrane domain two then the nbd2 and then your carboxy terminal so we are not talking about multiple polypeptides we are talking about single polypeptides with five different kind of the uh, domains now what happens is that if you want to uh, open the um, chloride ion channels uh, for that particular for that particular phenomenon you need the action of two other proteins uh, which are known as the protein kinase a for short that is pka so the pka is the protein kinase a and the other one is known as the protein kinase c uh, now i'm not going into the details of the protein kinase a or the protein kinase c i have detailed videos on them and i'll share the uh, links in the description but for the activation or for the opening of the uh, cftr ion channel uh, both of these proteins they are needed now the protein kinase a and the protein kinase c both of them uh, they are uh, uh, they are kinases in nature by that i mean that they are going to activate uh, that they are going to add a phosphate group in their substrate protein and in this particular case the substrate for the protein kinase a and the protein kinase c is the uh, regulatory subunit over here now what happens is that if you are interested in the opening of the um, ion channel in the cftr ion channel first the protein kinase c it is going to phosphorylate the regulatory subunit after that the protein kinase a is going to phosphorylate the regulatory subunit so the phosphorylation by the protein kinase c followed by the phosphorylation by the protein kinase a that is very really important for the activation or for the opening of the cftr protein so when the protein kinase c that first phosphorylate the regulatory subunit then the protein kinase a that regulate the uh, that phosphorylate the regulatory subunit after that there is a conformational change happening and in that particular case the nbd1 and the nbd2 they are going to come close to each other and when they come close to each other in that particular instance uh, an atp molecule is going to bind to the nbd1 uh, this is the first thing after that another atp molecule is going to bind to the nbd2 and when the atp molecule that is bound to both the nbd1 and the nbd2 this is going to open the ion channel so the uh, if i summarize the whole thing the protein kinase c it phosphorylate the regulatory subunit then the protein kinase a it phosphorylate the regulatory subunit so the regulatory subunit is phosphorylated by two different kinases after that there is conformational change happening in this particular uh, ion channel and because of that particular conformational changing an atp molecule is first going to bind to an nbd1 uh, domain 
after that another atp molecule is going to bind to the nbd2 uh, domain and when the atp is bind to both the nbd1 and the nbd2 this is going to make the uh, this uh, ion channel open and the chloride ion they can move you can see uh, outside of the cell and when they can move outside of the cell that means you can actually make the uh, uh, you can make the mucus in a thin form and that can perform its normal function if you are interested in closing the uh, CFTR protein the first thing you are going to do is that there are uh, phosphatases enzyme and the phosphatases they are the enzymes that remove the phosphate group from their substrate so they have a function opposite of the kinases the kinases when they act on their substrate they are going to add a phosphate group the phosphatases when they act on their substrate they are going to remove the phosphate group so what these phosphatases which are present in this membrane what they do is that they are going to act on the uh, regulatory subunit and they are, then they are going to uh, remove this phosphate group thereby dephosphorylating the uh, regulatory subunit now once the uh, regulatory subunit that have been uh, dephosphorylated uh, the end result is that the ATP that is bind to the NBD1 and the ATP that is bind to the NBD2 there is hydrolysis of the ATP the ATP is converted into the ADP and when the uh, NB the ATP that is bind to the NBD2 the ATP that is bind to the NBD1 when they are uh, converted or they are hydrolyzed into the ADP that is going to close the ion channel so when the ion channel that is closed that means you cannot move the chloride ions uh, from outside of the cell into the uh, from inside of the cell into the outside of the cell so this is a general structure and how the uh, CFTR protein it is open and how it is closed now, when you talk about this particular mutation at, uh, at mutation uh, uh, at position number 508, so this mutation is a class 2 mutation. And in class 2 mutation, there is abnormal processing uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum. Usually what happens is that when the proteins, they are made, they go through a process which is known as the post-translational modification. And this post-translational modification that usually occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, because of the mutation at position number 508, uh, this is actually going for the abnormal processing. And in this particular abnormal processing, what happens is that the nucleotide binding domain 1, as you have seen over here, because of this mutation, the NBD1, uh, that cannot bind the ATP correctly. And as I've told you that the binding of the ATP to the NBD1, <coughs> excuse me, the binding of the ATP, to the NBD1 that is very important for the opening of the CFTR protein. Now if there is problem in the uh, binding of the ATP to the NBD1 that means you cannot open the CFTR protein and that what happens in the uh, uh, patient with the cystic fibrosis because of the mutation the ATP cannot bind to the NBD1 you cannot open this the chloride ion they cannot move uh, you can say uh, outside the cell and when they cannot move outside the cell then mucus that become thick now subsequently the signaling from the ATP binding to open and close the chloride ion channel that does not occur and the cell uh, render the channel non-functional now another problem is that because of this this particular mutation uh, the uh, CFTR protein is then degraded uh, via the ubiquitin tagging and uh, the ubiquitin tagging simply means that when uh, when in the body a uh, proteins that need to be degraded uh, the ubiquitin proteasome system the ubiquitin proteasome system attach a ubiquitin molecule to that particular protein uh, which is distant for the degradation and then the proteasome is going to degrade that particular protein so because of the mutation the uh, protein the abnormal protein that is degraded by the ubiquitin tagging I also have a video on the ubiquitin proteasome system and also I, I will also share the link in the description. So when the uh, abnormal protein that is degraded, it simply means that there will be a lack of the CFTR protein on the epithelial surface and if there is shortage of the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if there is shortage of the CFTR protein on the epithelial cells, it simply means that it cannot pump chloride ions out of the cell which in turn means that water doesn't get drawn in and the secretion they are left overly thick 
because I've told you that normally the mucus is 97% uh, water and 3% of the solids including the mucins, the non-mucin proteins, the salt, the uh, lipids and the cellular debris. But when there is a problem with the CFTR protein, the concentration of the water that is going to decrease making this particular mucus thick and because of that there is problem in the uh, there is problem in the patients of the cystic fibrosis and uh, in, if you like the video please subscribe to my channel uh, hit the like button and uh, share it with your friends and in the next uh, part of this particular video i'll be talking about the genetics of the uh, cystic fibrosis how the cystic fibrosis that is inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern